Hello, hey everybody. I hope you guys are doing well. And uh, we are currently live this time on Facebook and Instagram again. So um, per usual, if you see me looking off um, this way or that way, it's because I'm trying to make sure everyone's engaged um, on both platforms. So I'm really excited to be here with you guys today. I have a message that I believe is very important. Um, no matter what's going on in the world, this is a message that is true blue, as like I like to call it, um, through all seasons of life. So hello everybody on Instagram over here. I hope you guys are doing well. Welcome, welcome. And hello everybody on Facebook. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, like usual, we're going to wait a couple minutes to start. Uh, but if you guys have any um, questions or anything before we start, go ahead and put them in the comments. And like usual, as we do before, um, when I give the scripture or when I say something that you believe is important and that other people should know about it, please put it in the comments. Um, I know I don't always converse with everybody on the comments as we're going live, but I'm gonna try to do that more because that's the whole point of being live is to be able to converse and talk to one another um, in the moment. And there are people who go and they come back and they watch this later on for those who couldn't watch live. Um, and that's cool too. But there's something special about doing everything in the moment and being present in the moment to be able to converse in the moment. So if any time throughout the study you have questions or something you want to bring up, um, please feel free to put it in the comments. Like I said, when I give scriptures out, please put those in the comments as well so other people can see them. That helps a ton. I always get a lot of um, messages from people during the week when they will, you know, just get a hold of me. Um, in pertaining to the message forthcoming and they'll always say um, keep having people put the the scriptures in the comments that really helps me or every time somebody will um, put into the comments a point that you made that really helps me if I missed it so feel free to comment while we're doing this Bible study we're all in this together that's why I do this live and uh, periodically when I do look up um, and I do see what's going on um, I do address certain comments as long as I find it to be appropriate in that time. So just wanted to get that out. So Amanda on Instagram says, how can I be sure that I'm seeking God with my whole heart? Um, that's a really great question. To seek God with your whole heart in, in the way that I look at it is to have pure intentions and to make sure that you are undivided. And what I mean by that is a lot of times we have a lot going on in the world right now. And that's kind of actually what the message is gonna be about today. But to follow after God with a pure heart and right intentions means to be undivided, means that you're not giving your heart, your mind, your soul to anything else in this world and instead you are keeping God at the focal point, front and center. Um, that's something that we have to keep ourselves in check with every single day, by the way. This is not something that's a once and for all thing. There's days where you're going to be running after God super hard and you have the word in front of you and you're powerful in prayer. And then all of a sudden, a couple days later, you know, travesty hits and you find yourself down and out. You don't have any um, excitement or motivation to do so, which is when you need to read and pray even more. But um, this is a daily thing. So with that being said, I hope that answered your question, Amanda, on Instagram. Hey, Ilya, how are you on Instagram? Um, hey, Kate, what is it? Caitlin, I think it says on Facebook, how are you doing? Uh, I have a light on me right now because it's kind of dark up here. So a lot of times that hurts my vision to be able to see what's being said. But I hope you guys are doing well. Um, once again, so basically we are going to be reading. There's one scripture that this whole entire study today is going to be based on. And that scripture, let me pull it up. I'm not going to read it quite yet. I'm going to wait till we start. But I'm going to tell you what that scripture is so you can... Put it in the comments for other people. And today's scripture is going to be 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. So once again, today's whole message is based off this one scripture. There's other scriptures we're going to be reading too. But this one particular scripture is the basis between, between the whole message today. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. So please put that in the comments for those who will be jumping on after we've already said it. And I'll be saying it again. 
but um, it's good to put this on here so those watching later in case they miss it as well can go ahead and see it pop up on the comments after I've said it. So thank you, Kate, on Facebook for putting that on there. I appreciate that. Um, but anyways, before we get started, I want to know how you guys are doing. Um, how are your hearts? What's going on in your world? There's a lot going on in the world, right? There's a lot going on around us. There's a lot of things being portrayed and said and misconstrued, so to speak. But I want to know how you guys are doing. Uh, present day, what's today's date? 28th of July. It's almost August. Um, how are you guys doing today? Where do you find yourselves today? Maybe you're in need of this message in regards to division, disunity, um, that's going on within the body of Christ. Um, somebody said on Instagram, single mom of four tired. I can't imagine. That is a lot to hold on to, to weigh into balance, especially with all that's going on in the world. Um, Elizabeth says on Facebook, she's feeling overwhelmed. I understand that too. Um, right now, there's a lot going on in the world, whether it's personal life or corporately, right? Somebody asks me, how are you doing, Amy? God bless you. I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. I'm doing really well. I'm ready for the study today. I believe that this study is very important, especially with all that's going on in the world. It's good to address uh, the different topics, but also too to address the present day um, enemy type yielded weapon that's going on towards the body of Christ, which is to stir up and cause disunity, strife, division, so on, so forth. Facebook, hey Terry, how are you doing? Kelly says, realizing how important it is to hate the sin, not people. Absolutely. That's very hard. And you have to keep that on the forefront too, because a lot of times it's very easy to forget Ephesians 6. when We are told that the weapons that um, of our warfare, first of all, are not carnal. Well, that's in 1 Corinthians, but also too, to go on to in Ephesians 6 saying that our, our, our weapons, our warfare, our war is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the principalities, the powers, the rulers, all those things. So yes, I agree with you. It's a very good thing to keep that on the forefront that uh, we are not to hate people, that we are to hate sin, sinful nature, the thing that separates us from God. Um, let's see, Grace says, hey, Amy, so excited to hear from you. Thank you for taking the time out of your week for these studies. Thank you for acknowledging that. I really appreciate it. A lot of times I have things going on in my life as well, and I could think of a thousand reasons um, on not to do a live stream. You know, we all could put things as more important into, you know, into effect, but I believe that these are important. And a lot of the times, when I'm studying during the week and God will give me some things to put on my heart to speak about during the week, I know that it cannot be put off for another week or another month. So um, thank you for acknowledging that. I really appreciate that. Someone said, yes, thank you for the studies that have been such a blessing, not only to me, but to many others. And I thank you for that. That is um, the whole reason why I do this. And as you guys maybe have been following me for a little bit, um, my whole main purpose on doing these videos is so that you can fall in love with the word of God more and more and more. And not just fall in love with the word of God, but to fall in love with God. Because the more that you learn about him, the more that you learn about his nature, the more that you learn about his heart, the more that you learn about his plan and his plans for redemption, the more you will come to love him and to want to commune with him more and to pray more and to spend more time with him. And that's my heart is for you guys um, in a world right now that is not prone to preaching the word of God for whatever reason that may be, and there's many reasons, by the way, um, the word of God is very rarely addressed and preached present day, I've learned. And um, somebody just asked me on here, Amy, do you believe in the spiritual gift of prophecy? Um, I do. I do actually. I do believe in the spiritual gift of prophecy. Um, I believe that it is highly abused, unfortunately, in this day and age. I believe there's a lot of people walking around that um, thus saith the Lord and they have no fear of the Lord. And a lot of times people speak out of assumption rather than wisdom. Uh, a lot of times too, the, the gifting of prophecy, in my opinion, has been abused in a lot of ways to... Um, use manipulative ways to make people do things that people want them to do or to um, pander or to elude to try to get money out of people. So just like any spiritual gift is what I'm trying to say. Every spiritual gift done with the wrong heart can be abused. But um, I do believe in the gift of prophecy. Um, but I believe it has to align with the word of God and it has to align with the will of God. So there's that. Good question. 
Um, somebody said, Jeremiah Johnson, have you seen him and what are your thoughts? Yes, I've seen Jeremiah Johnson. Um, I actually visited his church when he was a pastor in Lakeland, Florida, I think it was. Um, so he's kind of been on my radar since before he blew up to the world standards. Um, I'm very, very cautious on giving my opinion on people. The reason being is because man is fickle, right? Um, you, me, any preacher you see in this world, man uh, can be fickle, meaning they can be about something one day and they can be about something to totally different the next, right? So I'm very cautious on giving my opinion on people, but from what I can see, um, he has a good heart and he loves the Lord and he's a man of prayer from what I can see. Um, so that's my, my opinion on that. But anyways, we're going to start in two minutes. So if you guys have any more questions or any more comments or anything you want me to touch on really quick uh, before we jump in, please go ahead and put them in the comments. And after two minutes, I'm going to start. It says, somebody said, is this Bible study going to be posted on Instagram later? Yes, it will. Um, every Bible study that I do, I enjoy to put it on my Instagram and Facebook um, so others can watch. And I take that side note, I take that very seriously. The reason being is because every person is very important to God. Therefore, I believe the message needs to be um, done with prayer and discernment. I have close to 20,000 followers on Instagram and I have um, 5,000 plus 7,000 something followers on um, Facebook. And every single one of you matter and every single one of you I consider very important that I give you the right information, that I uh, truthfully and give out the, the scriptures rightfully, and uh, I take that very seriously. So anything that I do through these Bible studies and, and so on and so forth, or put it on my page, on my Instagram later on, um, I do so with great concern. And I believe that's something that is very important in this day and age, is to be mindful of who you follow, and to be mindful of the people whom you allow to speak into your life. Um, that is very, very important in my opinion. Somebody says, are you plugged into a local body as well? Michelle, um, so basically my husband and I have gone to a local church in, well, it's out here in Tennessee. It's called Grace Chapel. Um, and it's about an hour away from here. So I've watched um, through the live streams. But um, to say that I'm actively plugged in and involved it's been a huge prayer of mine lately. Um, I believe that community is very, very important. I believe that the body of Christ, especially the local church, is very important. Now, I find it very difficult to find a church that is rightfully dividing the word of truth, um, teaching it in a way that is right, that believes in the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit, that doesn't snuff the Holy Spirit out, that um, does things in the context of the right way, but yet also to believe in discipling others to go out and to reach right into the world. Um, present day, it's very hard to find churches like that. And uh, my husband and I have found that all to align at Grace Chapel where we've gone in Leapers Fork in um, Tennessee. Um, and now that church has started back up again, I do want to start actually physically getting back in there because that's been very difficult through all the whole COVID thing. Um, so great question. Um, but also too, don't just get involved into a church just to get involved into a church. Side note, um, that goes to anybody. There's a lot of people who feel like it's their duty to just belong to a church and it doesn't matter which church you go to as long as you're going. That's dangerous. Make sure you know exactly the type of church you are planting into. Make sure you know their beliefs. Make sure that they are teaching the word of God and that they're teaching it rightfully. Uh, make sure that their belief system aligns with the word. And also to make sure that they are people who are devoted to missions and devoted to making disciples and sending people out. That's very important. And a lot of churches tend to sometimes um, neglect that. So anyways, all that to say, we are going to start. It is 7.15. Um, we are going to be reading once again out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I'm going to go ahead and read this to you first. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of a preface because I want to kind of give you an understanding of where we're coming from when it comes to this scripture and what we're talking about today. So first and foremost, let me say that the title of today's message is called Let There Be No Divisions Among You. Somebody put that in the comments, please. 
Can somebody scream that from the rooftop, right? Thank you, Kelly, and Facebook for putting that on there. Um, let there be no divisions among you. What a declaration. And it's actually not my declaration. This is not something that Amy thought of. Uh, this is actually something that the Apostle Paul declared. And we're going to be reading it right now in 1 Corinthians 1.10. So Paul says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I'm going to read that one more time. It's one scripture but it is jam-packed with truth. And we're going to unpack it because I believe it's very crucial for you to understand what he's talking about. Because when you read the scripture as it is, I'm pulling it out of context. And I don't like pulling things out of context. And what I mean by that is I like to give you the surrounding data behind the reason why he's saying something. Because a lot of times there's people who love quoting scripture. There's a lot of people who know scripture by heart, but they'll give you one scripture and they'll leave out the entire context, leaving you with the presumption that it means something that it actually doesn't. So it's really important for you to understand what's going on in this moment, why Paul's saying this. But before we get there, I'm going to read one more time what he's saying, and then we'll talk about context. So 1 Corinthians 1.10, now I plead with you. What is he doing? He's begging. He's pleading. I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, not by his standard, not by his own name. He says, instead, I am coming to you and I'm pleading to you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now he's putting into context for you that before God, I am saying this to you, meaning if I'm wrong in this or I'm speaking on my own behalf, let God hold me accountable because I'm coming in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to speak this one message to you. So he says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here it is that you all, who's you all? He's talking about the body of Christ, right? The body of Christ. How do we know? He says, brethren, he's speaking to you within the family of believers, and he says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. That you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you. But that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So let's look at that second part for a moment. The he says that there's going to be no divisions among you. Think about that for a minute. He's pleading with you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you speak the same things and that there be no division among you. But he follows it up with what he does expect. And I love that, by the way, in regards to Paul and in regards to Jesus, that when there is a message being preached, they tell you exactly what they don't want you to do, but they always usually follow it up with telling you what they do expect of you to do. The opposite, the thing to combat this thing, this issue that can take root and destroy unity within the body of Christ. And so that's what he does. He follows it up. He says that you all speak in the same thing, but that there be no divisions among you. Here we go. But that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Where does the judgment come from? Now, here's what I love. Have you ever heard, whether it's Christians or even the world, they love slinging around that phrase, only God can judge me, right? Or don't judge me. You're not supposed to judge. Christians are supposed to love. They're not supposed to judge. Okay, well, I, I want everybody to know in this moment that there's wrong judgment and there's righteous judgment. And God has called us to yield righteous judgment. And we can see that by the simple fact 
that Paul says right here that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So there is judgment to be yielded somewhere along the lines of being a Christian, but he says that we need to be in the same mind and in the same judgment on how we give that and profess that to the world. That, to me, is very important because in this day and age, we have a lot of garbage, and I'm going to call it what it is. We have a lot of garbage being slung around as truth. And a lot of times, it's very popular preachers who have a major platform who somehow have found a way to pander personal worldly opinions instead of preaching the word of God. And what this does is this begins to breed a major, major, major dissension and disunity within the body of Christ. Why? Because when you begin to remove truth, and I'm not talking about your truth. You know that phrase um, that's often given out nowadays and it's, it's said, um, you know, speak your truth or preach your truth. Okay, that, does not, that doesn't even exist in the Christian world. Do you hear me? There is one truth. There is one word. You want to be known as a man or woman of the word, of your word? Be known as a man or woman of God's word. That's the truth that you are to portray and to give out to the world. Opinion has its place in certain conversations, and that's fine. Listen, here's a side note. Here's my side note. Ready? There's a lot of deception going on in the world. I am 100% for exposing the evil, wicked works, unfruitful works of darkness, like it says in the Bible. I'm 100% for exposing unfruitful works of darkness, whatever that may be. If somebody is calling something evil good, I'm going to come out and show them really what's good and what's evil, right? If somebody is saying that uh, this is the way, walk in it, and it's not the way of Jesus Christ, I'm going to speak up and say, wait a minute, don't go that way, go this way, right? So I'm all for speaking truth, and I'm all for calling out and exposing the unfruitful works of darkness, but... I believe that that never should come above the word of God. That should never come above teaching the word of God, preaching the word of God. And you want to know why there's so many Christians right now on the front lines who don't feel like they're ready to fight? You want to know why there's so many people right now who are saying, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Look at all the things going on in the world and I don't know how to fight. It's because we haven't been taught how to use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Some people are showing up to the battle with the sword and they don't know how to use it. And some people are showing up to the battle with no sword at all because they've never been taught the word of God. They do not understand how to apply it to their life. And they wonder why they feel like they're getting beaten and torn and they're unstable and unwavering in all of their ways. And we're going to see why in a minute. It's because just like the end, compared to the beginning, there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. It's very, very interesting to me when people have made it their mandate in life, and hear me when I say this, to cause more division within the body of Christ than to simply call out what needs to be called out and then offer the solution and move on. And I see that a lot right now, present day. Now, let's look at context really quick. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 10, what we just read, Paul is specifically talking about sectarianism. Now, I want to give you a biblical definition of what sectarianism is so you can understand what kind of division he's talking about. Sectarianism is a form of prejudice, discrimination, or hatred arising from attaching relations of inferiority and superiority to differences between subdivisions within a group. Now, that was wordy. Let me say it again. Sectarianism is a form, right? 
It's, it looks like something. It, it is a, it's a certain type of something. Sectarianism is a form of prejudice, discrimination, or hatred arising from, here it is, attaching relations of inferiority or superiority. So to be inferior, think about crouching down, or superior, puffing up your chest and squaring your shoulders back, right? Attaching relations of inferiority or superiority to differences between subdivisions within a group. So let me tell you what that looks like. It's taking the body of Christ as it is, right? So you have Christ as the head, and then you have the body. Uh, somebody asked me for the spelling. Absolutely. Sectarianism starts with an S, and it is spelled S E C. T as in Tom, A R I, A N as in Nancy, I, S as in Sam, N as in Mary, sectarianism. Hope that helps. If not, just write it down later, put a little note to check the spelling. Um, so what happens is you have, you have Christ as the head, and then you have the body, right? And I have a lot of women who message me about this one situation because there's a lot of confusion in it, and I get it. Because hear me out, and I'm going to say this one more time before I help you understand this one area. There is way more being preached from pulpits nowadays that have to do with pandering and opinions than anything but being with the Word of God. That's why I have more women message me present day. I could go through my direct messages, whether on Facebook or Instagram, and I could show you message after message from women of all different ages who come to me and say, Amy, I don't understand scripture. I don't know how to read it. I get confused. And I say, okay, Who's teaching you or who are you listening to that's taking the scriptures one by one and helping you understand what they mean? They say, nobody. I say, who are you listening to? And I'm sorry to say, I'm just going to be honest. A lot of the people they listen to are very popular preachers nowadays who hold massive platforms, who are afraid to speak truth because they don't want to upset the crowd. They want to pander to a certain opinion. And then everybody's left what? Divided because nobody knows what the truth is up to, into a matter. So I have all these people, young women, who will message me and say, you say it's a spiritual battle, but I don't even know what that means. I don't know how to fight this. What do I do? I said, okay, take the sword of the spirit. What's the sword of the spirit? So that's the word of God. No wonder you don't feel like you're ready for battle because you don't even have the, what? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God to be able to fight the battles. Matthew 4, Jesus spoke to the enemy on a couple separate different occasions in the wilderness. And every single time the enemy brought him with a temptation, what did Jesus do? He said, for it is written, for it is written, for it is written. He used the word to combat the enemy. Why? Well, when you submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. If you take out submission to God and you just have resist the devil and he will flee from you. Impossible. You cannot resist the devil if you first do not submit to God. You cannot submit to God if you don't understand what his word is. And you cannot apply and yield the word of God into any situation if you don't understand what it is because you don't know it. You weren't taught it. You don't know how to apply it. This is huge nowadays. And it's not popular. And I've been called legalistic and all the things you can think of in the book because oh, all you say is the word of God. All you, You're totally missing the relationship aspect. No, that's the problem. If you remove the relationship aspect from the word of God, you're the one in error because you don't realize that it's God's perfect word. It's his thoughts. It's his mind. You need to know it. You need to know how to understand it, to apply it, to speak it, to pray it. It's important. And this is why there's so much division going on. Now, here's the thing. Don't get me wrong when I say, when I bring it back to sectarianism, because the problem in this, in this context, what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 1.10, is he's warning, he's warning about divisions. He understands. The enemy will use division because he understands the power of unity. Let me say that again. The enemy uses division because he understands the power and authority. I can't help but go back to the book of Acts, and I see in Acts, I believe, chapter 2, 
that the Holy Spirit descended upon the believers in the upper room where it says they were in one accord. They were in one mind. They were in unity. The power came from on high. The promised gift that Jesus spoke about descended upon those believers in that room when they were in one accord, praying the same thing. They were not fighting among one another, trying to figure out who had it more right than the other. No, they were in one accord in that room, praying with the same mind, believing for the same thing. And you don't think there's power in unity? The problem is, is we do not speak on that anymore. The problem is, is we don't talk as if that's even important anymore. And unity is important. And if you do not know the word of God and you do not sit under people who teach it rightfully, you will be confused. You will not be able to discern the truth from a lie. So as we see here, sectarianism is what in context he's referring to in 1 Corinthians. But what does that look like? Well, let me give you an example. Jesus is the head, you have the body, right? Well, what happens if we start subleasing ourselves to different things within the body? Meaning, we don't keep the main thing the main thing. Meaning, we divide ourselves within our own group. What happens? You start breaking off into all these different numbers. You start breaking off into all these different belief systems. Do you know how many denominations currently exist today? We can't even, well, sorry to say, agree on some of the most very, very crucial yet simple matters. And then we want to go out into the world and say, hey, come join us. You know, look what Christ did for us. Look at the, And they're looking at us like, y'all can't even get along. What do you want me to do? I already have enough disunity in my life. You want me to come join you guys? All you guys are fighting among one another. That's why, you guys, I don't play these games of fighting religiously with one another on matters that really truly are not important in the grand scheme of things. Do you realize that there was a time, I believe it was in the book of Mark, I think it's Mark chapter 9, I have it written down, I'll have to look. Mark 9, 40. Um, there were those who were doing things in a way that were not the same as the disciples and the disciples went to Jesus. And they said, oh, do you want us to take them out? Do you want us to take those guys out? And Jesus says, listen, I actually put it right here. He says, for he who is not against us is on our side. He who is not against us is on our side. That's Mark chapter 9, verse 40. Jesus' response to a almost opportunity of causing massive division. Jesus' response was, for he who is not against us is on our side. Boy, would it do us a lot of good present day to speak that same thing, to speak that same truth, with all that's going on in the world, if it is true in that moment. Don't just say it to say it. But a lot of times, the church is fighting one another over small matters that do nothing but divide. And then we do the enemy's work for him, right? Because he understands the power in unity. That's why since the beginning, the enemy's been trying to conquer and divide. That's why he's trying to scatter the sheep. That's why he's trying to make us all our own little island. It's not how it's supposed to be. But we've divided ourselves among all these different groups. And then we wonder why, as a, as a whole, as a community, look at the word community, common unity. But yet we hold no common unity among one another when we're fighting one another, whether it be about religious matters or matters in the world. Now, I have a couple definitions for you because I want to talk to you in regards to some of the words in 1 Corinthians 1.10. Because it says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So I want to go over a couple of key words and um, definitions that I find to be very helpful for me to understand exactly what is going on in this scripture. So number one, division. The definition of division means the act or process of dividing, or it is a state of being divided. The act or process of dividing, or the state of being divided. All right, now let's look at divide. 
Divide means to separate into two or more parts, areas, or groups. Once again, divide. To divide means to separate into two or more parts, areas, or groups. All right? Well, let's look at the word disunity. Disunity means the lack of unity and one accord. So definition of disunity, the lack of unity and one accord. I want to look at dissension. Here's a good one. This one describes present day what's going on a lot in the world, whether it's in the church or out. Disunity means the strong disagreement or contention or quarrel that leads to discord. Let me say that again. Dissension means a strong disagreement, not just a disagreement. Hear me out. Don't ever fall into the trap that in order to disagree with somebody means they're automatically your enemy, okay? That's a lot of the issue going on today is we are not listening to one another, we are not hearing one another, and the minute that somebody doesn't agree with us, we don't even speak to them. Well, how in the world are you gonna witness to an unbeliever? Automatically, right off the bat, they don't believe what you believe. Automatically, right off the bat, they're in disunity, technically, because they disagree with you. How are you going to reach them if you are not willing to have a conversation with somebody who does not believe the same thing you believe? That's where sectarianism come in. It comes in by saying it's what? That superiority, remember? The superiority that rises up that says, well, I'm right, you're wrong. There's no point to talk about this. I hope you get it someday. I'll be praying for you. That's a passive aggressive approach. And I promise you that's not gonna reach anybody to Christ. Now you be honest, you be real. You tell them that hell is real. You offer them the amazing gift of repentance to be able to be reconciled through Christ Jesus unto God because of his sacrifice. But you have to have that conversation and you can't be pious about it. Same with other situations and worldly situations going on in the world. You can't be pious about it. You can't be judgmental in the sense that you have a superiority. Because the Bible also says that God shows no partiality. Do you know what that means? That means that he is not looking saying this person's better than this person and you're better than that person and I actually like you more so I'm going to lift you up here and put you... No, listen. We need to be honest with our approach in the gospel but we need to do it with humility. Jesus, who was the son of God, thought himself to be nothing of any great stature and came on to this world and walked among the created to save us. When he could have used his authority and power through God, through heaven, to be able to yield anything on this earth. And the devil in Matthew 4 tried to get him to do that outside of his time, but he didn't. This talks about in Philippians. He did not consider any of these things good for him to rise up above or have any kind of special authority. He was fully God, but he was fully man. He still had humanity. And we need to use the same humility when speaking and reaching others. This is important. And this goes from all topics and in all situations right now going on in the world. And I'm going to get on that in a minute, especially with present day trigger topics. Because the world wants to pressure you into speaking prematurely about something that you don't have knowledge of. Maybe you do, and that's good. But you better make sure God is calling you to speak on something before you just follow the crowd and start speaking on it. And a lot of times, I can promise you, he's not going to have you speak on something too soon. You are an ambassador for the kingdom of God. That means you represent a kingdom. You are here today representing a different kingdom because that is where your citizenship is from. Always keep that at the forefront of your mind before you start speaking on anything else. Now, like I said before, expose the unfruitful works of darkness. Speak truth. Do it in a way that has humility and boldness and love. But don't just speak on something because everybody else is. Don't just share an article because somebody else is. Don't just share videos and whatnot because everybody else is. You know how many times I wanted to do that and I felt that nudge from the Holy Spirit say, nope, delete that, delete that comment, 
delete that post. You're not saying that. And then a couple days later, what I was going to say actually ended up becoming completely false and somebody debunked it or something happened or that, that article wasn't really a real article. Oh, I was so happy I heard the Lord because you want to know what? Credibility matters. Be known for the word of God. Be known for knowing the word of God. Be known for your intim intimacy with God. Be known as a man or woman of prayer. Don't be just known as the person who posts about this or talks about this first. Y'all, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Be the one who points others to the truth because there is a world right now that is going through major confusion. Everything that we've ever known living in this world is being completely shooken up and tipped upside down. The good news is, is you, as a believer, you have truth. You realize that? You have truth. You have the answer that everybody in this world is looking for. They may not know that the answer you have is what they're looking for, but you have it. So when everything crumbles apart, when everything falls apart, when everything stops making sense and everything that can be shaken is shaken, the only thing that's going to remain is Christ Jesus. And you have that truth to be able to portray to the world so that when people are fearful or have anxiety or they're angry or they're frustrated or they're upset, you can come on the scene and the stature saturated in peace and people don't get it. Why? Because you're walking in the peace that surpasses all understanding. And they're saying, wait a minute, you're supposed to be upset. You're supposed to be fearful. You're supposed to be scared. You're supposed to be angry. That person just cussed you out. Why? Why are you freaking out? Why aren't you upset? Well, you walk in a different spirit. You don't walk in the way that the world does anything. You walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. You're walking in that spirit of Jesus. You're walking within the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be moved by things of this world. Why? Because he who lives in you has overcome this world. Show them what that looks like and don't fall into the trap of being in discord or dissension with not only believers, but other people as well. Now hear me out. You will not be in unity with the world and you're not supposed to be in unity with the world. If you see pastors or preachers trying to be in unison with the world, red flag nowhere in the scriptures nowhere did god tell us to walk in unity with the world as a matter of fact it says to be in the world but not of it you are supposed to be in unity with believers now does that mean you act like a jerk to people who are unbelievers no that goes back to the humility thing but it doesn't mean that you are going to be in complete unity with the world. The world is going to be against your message, but you're supposed to be peacemakers. And through that peace and the love and the power of the Holy Spirit, you can bring them to come to know Christ. But boy, is that going to be a hard message when you're too busy fighting everybody else, right? I see a lot of Christians sometimes, they, they make it their mandate to fight with one another. They're, they're fighting um, among different belief systems and, and they're fighting. And it's just not even a testimony at that point. You look at that and you're like, I, I don't want anything having to do with that. As a matter of fact, I feel like that's not, Jesus did not partake in all of the arguments with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He called them out when it was necessary and right. He called out their accusations. He discerned their hearts and their thoughts. But he didn't just play around to fight and argue. Neither did John the Baptist. You guys, be careful on what you give your attention to. This world is fleeting, and the things that the world thinks are important are fleeting. So going into dissension, once again, it means strong disagreement, a contention or a quarrel that leads to discord. And then to decipher discord, which is our last one, discord means the lack of agreement or harmony as between persons, things, or ideas. Once again, discord is the lack of agreement or harmony between persons, things, or ideas. Present day, there is a weapon being yielded by the enemy. And that is the course of disunity, discord, dissension. There's nothing new under the sun. This is not something that we've never seen before. But I'm telling you that in this day and age, with all that's going on in the world right now, pay attention to what's being talked about. We've got everybody complaining and arguing about so many different things. And I see the body of Christ doing it within one another. And once again, I cannot say it enough. 
You have to expose the unfruitful works of darkness. There's nothing wrong with that. But if all you're doing is dabbling in discord and dissension and you're causing disunity among other people or even within your own camp, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. Be very careful. Be very careful and tread carefully in that. People will only see the discord and dissension and they won't pay attention to what you're saying. Now, the devil knows, like I said earlier, that unity is very powerful. When the body of Christ is unified in one accord, it has the same mind and the same judgment as he says in 1 Corinthians 1.10. There is something to be said of a group with unity because unity is so incredibly rare nowadays. And yet, this is going to hurt to hear but um, understand my heart when I say this. I see the works of darkness utilizing more unity for their wickedness than I see believers utilizing unity for truth. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I see those who are workers of iniquity and those who are workers of sin and all the dirty and disgusting things in this world I see all of them agree more on their wickedness than I see Christians agree on truth. You don't believe me? Go look into the world right now. Look at the mandate and the propaganda that's being spewed out right now into the world. They know what their message is. Do you know what your message is as a believer? The enemy knows what his message is. He has no problem pandering it. As a matter of fact, they all agree on it. I don't see very much discord within this, this darkness because they've all agreed on what their message and propaganda is. They know what they're doing. They have organized themselves greatly. Are you organized? Do you, do you know your mandate? Do we as the church know our mandate? Do we know the word of God strong enough to be able to utilize it as the sword that it is to cut through the deception going on in the world? I'll be honest with you. I don't know a lot of Christians who not only know the word of God strongly, but know how to apply it and understand it rightfully as well. And that is what I believe is one of the biggest deceptions of our time right now is that somehow we think we've got it all together and we're just waiting for Jesus to come. I hope that's not your attitude. I hope your attitude isn't just looking at what's going on and saying, well, I just can't wait till Jesus comes. I hope that's not your attitude. Yes, believe and hope and pray and keep your eyes to the sky and be excited about Jesus coming, but you are here today because you have work to do, my friends. You have work to do on this earth. You think your time is up because of your age? Because of your gender? Because of where you were born or what family you were born into or what city you were born into, you think your time's up? You're breathing and you're still here today because there is a purpose for you. What are you doing with it? And if you don't know what it is yet, pray and ask the Lord. Pray. So here is what the enemy is after. He wants us divided by our mindsets so we are unstable. Write that down, please. You always want to know how the enemy's lurking or do you want to be able to discern the enemy in a situation? He wants us divided by our mindsets so that we are unstable. How do I know that? Well, James 1.8 says, He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Now, this is talking on the sense of faith. Those who pray something but don't follow it with faith. But understand what it's saying here. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Do not be double-minded. We, the church, cannot be double-minded. 
That means that we say this, but we mean this. Or half the church is saying this, but half the church is saying that. Or half the church is doing this, but half the other church is doing that. No, we are unable to stand right now as the church because we're double-minded. We have too many belief systems being saturated within the church right now. And we think that all of, oh my gosh, this is such a travesty. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to fight. Well, it's because we need to, we need to get together. We need a unity session here. We need to get together and pray the same thing, speak the same thing have the same judgment to not be divided and to not give our attention and our heart and our mind to anything going on in this world above the Lord Jesus Christ. Please hear me. It is so easy to get caught up in what's going on in the world right now, whether somebody should wear masks or somebody shouldn't wear masks or whether this doctor said this or that doctor said that or whether the Democrat said this or the Republican said that or whether Trump is a jerk or Trump is good or whether this person thinks this or this person says this. Or Listen to me. Be careful. Do not give your heart, your attention, your mind, your worship to anything more or outside of Christ Jesus. If it does not align with the word of God, please throw it out. Please stop giving so much heart to it. Now, yes, like I said for the hundredth time tonight, expose the unfruitful works of darkness. You better darn well believe I will always speak out against things that I know to be false when I see them. Why? Because I don't want people falling into deception. But when God tells me to speak on the matter, I will speak on it. When he does it, I shut my mouth. Oh, Amy, you haven't said anything about masks. You want to know why? Because that's not something that God has said, hey, this is a really hot button issue right now that I want you to speak on. No, that's not what God has me focusing on right now. Maybe other people want to talk on it. Maybe they're being called to talk on it, and that's fine. But that's not where I am right now. Do I have an opinion on it? Yes. Am I going to talk about it to you? No. You want to know why? Because my opinion does not matter. You will not be saved nor sanctified because of Amy Clutinati's opinion. You will not be able to discern the truth from a lie because of Amy Clutinati's opinion. But you will be able to do it if I tell you what the word says. You will be able to do it if I have you know what Jesus said about it. You will be able to discern right if you know truth and then from there you can discern the truth from a lie. So other than that, you don't need to know my opinion. When God calls me to speak on it, I will. But other than that, far be it for me to ever sow any discord or division because that is so easy to do. And you can have your opinion and that's fine. But be mindful and use wisdom on how much attention you're giving to the topics of which you want to speak on. That's all I'm saying. I will share my opinion with you guys when the Lord puts it on my heart that it'll be fruitful to do so. Other than that, I'm just not going to talk to talk. There's too many people talking to just talk out there right now. And you want to know what? As a side note, just because this is something that I feel like the Lord's putting on my heart right now. When it comes to um, things that are labeled as conspiracy theories in this world, um, I have been following a lot of darkness and deception type um, things that have been hidden, let's put it that way, for years. God has had me praying against human trafficking for years God has had me praying against elite pedophilia for years. God has had me warring and praying in regards to our nation and leadership for years. But he hasn't released me to talk on it yet. And I have nothing to prove, so I don't do it. Amen? I'll do it when he tells me to do it. So anyways, here's another scripture about mindsets. 1 Corinthians 2.16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Nothing else. The mind of Christ. The second thing that the enemy looks for, listen, as we're wrapping, wrapping up, he wants our judgments to be divided so we appear as hypocrites. Remember in 1 Corinthians one ten, when Paul says to have the same mind and the same judgments, the enemy would love nothing more for our judgments to be divided. Because that, to me, 
is the exact way that he wanted to portray us to the world, right? Matthew 7, in Matthew 7, there's one specific scripture where he says, you hypocrite, take out the log that is in your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. I love that. It means to be aware of yourself. It means to understand where you are. Take note of your position. Take note of where you stand. And then, when you rightfully discern the truth and you can stand before God, then from there, make sure that you then can look at others, right? You can. It's not about not judging at all. It's about righteous judgment and unrighteous judgment. So let's look at this again as we wrap up. 1 Corinthians 1.10 Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Notice the scripture doesn't say, let there be no divisions among you in the world. It says, let there be no divisions among you. And it's speaking to you as the family of believers. Now, let me say this, in a world that calls evil good and good evil, we are not to stay silent. Now, you know, you know I, that's how I, um, I portray that message quite often. God is not recalling you to um, stay silent in every matter, but you need to use discernment. Somebody asks, what translation uh, do you use or do you have? I usually read out of the New King James Version. All right, so there's one more scripture. Oh, actually, I want to say this really quick. This is in my notes. It is possible to disagree and not promote dissension. Did you know that? It is possible to disagree and not promote dissension. It is possible to disagree and still love your neighbor. Did you know that? Disagreeing does not equal hate. So don't fall into the lie that just because somebody disagrees with you or you disagree with somebody that all of a sudden now you're hateful because you don't have the same opinion as them. That's what the world says. Just a reminder of Mark 9 40. Jesus says, for he who is not against us is on our side. And last but not least, because I have about two minutes left, I want to leave you with 1 Peter 3, 8 through 16. Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you we're called to this and that you may inherit a blessing for he who would love life and see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Wow. For those of you who might have missed that, that was 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 16. I want you to read that again on your own time. Keep that as the focal point. Keep that on your forefront. Be mindful of the way that you portray the message to other people and be mindful of the number one thing that you do speak on. You know what I'm saying? Be known for Jesus. Other things can be spoken about. Other things can be touched on. And it's okay to disagree when it comes to other certain things. But keep Christ front and center. This world needs answers because there's going to be a lot of shaking. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. You possess the one message that the world needs to hear. Do you realize that as a believer? 
You possess the one message. You have the one hope. The Bible says, always be ready to give an account and attest to the hope that you have, which is, by the way, the foundational aspect of who you are today as a believer. It's Christ Jesus. Understand why you believe what you believe. Point others to that hope. Show them why it is you chose Christ. Share your testimony. We shall overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. That's power. All these things in the world are fleeting. Everything you see right now is passing away. But Christ, the word, it will stand forever. Preach a worthy message to this world. Leave a legacy of Christ Jesus. You will not be sorry for it. Have a good night.